So nearly any kind of preferences can be represented by a utility function. I mean, the big kind of caveat there is um, if preferences are like intransitive, so they're not transitive. Remember, transitivity was one of our big assumptions about preferences. If they're not transitive, that that's not going to be possible to have, have necessarily a utility function. So nearly all um, kinds of, I'm going to put in brackets, reasonable preferences can be described through or by um, utility functions. So again, you know, an exception. So when I say reasonable, so it's ruling out like uh, intransitive, I guess we could call them, preferences. So remember we talked about uh, transitivity, you know, if I like x more than y and y more than z, that means I like x more than z. So that was like transitivity. Think about the kind of consistency in, in what you want. Um, if, if that's not true, then it's going to be it's going to be hard to represent those kind of preferences with utility functions. So since we have indifference curves, essentially we just need a way, a way to like label these indifference curves. We just need a way to label them such that higher indifference curves get higher numbers. So we could think of a really easy way to do that, which might not be the best all the time, but um, by labeling each indifference curve with its distance from the origin. So if it's monotonic, monotonic, it's only going to cross once, right? in the sense that a line from the origin is only going to cross each indifference curve once if we have that monotonicity assumption holding that we, that we made before. So if we have good 2 and good 1 and we drew kind of these different indifference curves, well, one way to label them is just to start with a straight line from the origin. And this is just a measure of distance and let's say this is, you know, one away, so we're going to label this in difference curve one, and this is two, we're going to label it two, and let's pretend it's all the same, and three, and so on and so forth. So that's like one way of thinking about, um, you know, coming up with labeling these in different curves. But it's, you know, it's not going to be the best way necessarily. So next, why don't we kind of go back to these in difference curves that we saw last chapter in chapter three. Remember we looked at things like perfect, comp uh, perfect complements, perfect substitutes, and things like that. And now let's think about what the utility functions that correspond to those, um, to those indifference curves might look like, like mathematically. So as I was just saying, in chapter three, we saw in difference curves to represent certain preferences. We can also represent them with utility functions. And also represent with utility functions.
So if given a utility function u of x1, x2, so some utility function we have two goods, we can plot all points x1, x2, all the different combinations of good 1 and good 2, such that um, this utility is constant. So we kind of call that a level set. So it's like a level set of, of this. So basically, we're given some utility function, and then we're going to plot out all the different combinations of good one and good two, assuming we just have two goods, um, where, where that utility function is, is the same. The value of plugging in x1 and x2 to that utility function is constant. So for instance, before we get on to the, kind of the preferences that we saw before, let's say we have some utility function x1, x2, which is just equal to x1 times x2. So each indifference curve is just the set of, of good one, you know, all the combinations of good one and good two that, that multiply to a certain number. Each indifference curve is the set of all x1 and x2 such that x1 times x2 equals some constant, right? So this is some constant. So 1 or 2 or 0 0.37 or whatever, but just some number. And so everything along that indifference curve, like all the combinations of good when multiplied, uh, multiplied by each other always equal that constant, that's going to give us the whole indifference curve. So what we could do is, I'm not sure, I'll try to do it down here, um, can solve for x2 as a function of x1, right? So x2 equals k over x1. Just rearranging this, right? Dividing both sides by x1, we get x2 equals k over x1. And so then we're essentially we're just plotting all of these, right? We're plotting x1 and then all the x2s um, as a function of the x1s. And you know, we're going to get something that looks like, you know, here's x2. Hopefully it's not too small for you. So this is like all the different combinations. And again, I'm just kind of drawing it here, but all the different combinations where multiplying x2 by x1 gives you 1. And you can do the same thing with, with 2, where they all where they multiply to give you a 2, and then 3, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of how we're thinking about constructing um, utility functions. Or like, you know, we're thinking of going from these indifference curves to utility, sorry, from the utility functions to the indifference curves. Kind of next, what we're going to do is kind of go, you know, we're going to explore this a little bit more, but then we're going to kind of go the opposite. We're going to kind of look at the indifference curves um, that we saw in chapter, the last chapter, chapter three, and think about, well, mathematically, what is the function that, that kind of is representing those indifference curves? But kind of before we move on to that, I just want to remind ourselves that. You know, that wasn't unique. You know, we came up with, let's just write it out again, this utility function of x1, x2. I'm just being lazy here. Uh, this utility function of x1 and x2 that we just multiplied, you know, that was a way, you know, that was a utility, uh, sorry, indifference curve. This is a utility function. We can represent that with, with those different indifference curves. But that's not a unique way to label those indifference curves, like one, two, three. You know, we could take any monotonic transformation of this, and that's going to just be a different way of labeling those exact same indifference curves. All that's important is, is the order, right? Because we're looking at ordinal utility. So what about instead of 
x1 times x2, we could have v of x1, x2 instead of u, which equals x1 squared, x2 squared. Well, that just equals x1 times x2 squared, which is just actually the utility of x1, x. You know, this is the original utility function we're looking at squared. So this v is just a monotonic transformation of u. Monotonic transformation of this u that we are looking at. You know, u is not negative, which is which is important here. Um, so this means that I mean that these indifference curve have the exact same shape. and bundles just different labels. So if I could have you know, drawn the old ones out, if I still had them up, now if we're going to use this B function and we're going to draw up these different combinations, instead of, you know, here's our k equals 1, and then the next one, instead of k equals 2, it's k equals 4. Right? It's, but it's the same bundles, and, and you know, what this k equals doesn't matter, it's just the order. It's just like that we prefer all these bundles to all these. It doesn't matter like the number we use to label it. It just matters the order, right, when we're dealing with ordinal utility. So this monotonic transformation is giving you the exact same thing as, as the original x1 times x2 if you just square it. All right. So now that we've kind of thought about that, let's, let's go back to think about you know, how we're going to go from utility functions to indifference curves or indifference curves to utility functions.